Now, I cannot stress enough how important or how paramount electrical isolation is as an endpoint of any catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, either in paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. Now, electrical isolation of the pulmonary veins has a clear definition. It is defined as the stable absence of any conduction into the PVs from the left atrium being entrance block, but as well as in the opposite direction, being from the PV into the left atrium, which is exit block. In this beautiful anatomical picture, you can see the circular sleeves or the muscle surrounding the endothelium of the vein, which is responsible for the arrhythmia and for the generation of the local PV potentials. Now, the definition implies several parts. It's the absence of any conduction into the PVs from the left atrium. We will assess this with circular mapping catheters, being either a conventional lasso catheter or the PIVA catheter. It means that during antigrade conduction, you have elimination of the sharp PV potentials during the procedure. Here you see a circular mapping catheter in the left inferior pulmonary vein, and you see complete elimination of the pulmonary vein potentials. The absence of conduction into the PV has to be stable. It means that your endpoint should be challenged either by time or by adenosine injection. Here you see an example of the effect of waiting time. At five o'clock in the afternoon, this left inferior pulmonary vein is isolated, as you can appreciate from the recordings from the circular mapping catheter. But one hour later, you can see that there is reappearance of these sharp pulmonary vein potentials and that additional ablation is required for the endpoint. The endpoint also implies that there is block in the opposite direction being exit block. This is, of course, not easy to show because you need pacing within the circle to prove this. If you are happy, you will be lucky if you can have automaticity of the pulmonary vein during sinus rhythm. Here you see a PVAC tracing in the right superior pulmonary vein before ablation. You can see far fuel potential and you can see the PV potentials, sharp potentials. You have entrance block and the only thing that remains is far field on the tracings from the PVAC catheter. But you can see that there is a dissociated rhythm arising from the sleeves of the pulmonary veins. Now, this is an example, of course, of exit block. And the phenomenon itself is a proof of bidirectional isolation. Now, validation of PV isolation as you will all agree, it's essential for efficacy and safety, but it can be difficult. And with the PVAC catheter, it might be as difficult or more difficult than with a conventional circular mapping catheter. And I will explain you why. In the left, you can see the potential before any ablation on the circular mapping catheter in the pulmonary vein or at the ostium. And you can see an overlap of different potentials. On the right panel, I show you the signals after obtaining an EDO PV rhythm. So we know that there is bidirectional isolation. So we know that this is the far field. And as you can appreciate, far field can be large amplitude as well. Far field can be double as well. And on the other hand, if you look at the pulmonary vein sleeve, the pulmonary vein sleeve is not always that sharp and that of high amplitude, but it can also be tiny, fragmented. So not a, a tiny potential can be EPP potential as well. So what are the tricks to reliably validate PV isolation? With the PVAC catheter, we have to put together all the pieces of the puzzle. And I will discuss with you the first four points. The last point will be discussed by Thomas Denig. First of all, we have to recognize the pros and the cons of the catheter. 
And the beaver cat has a specific design. So let's compare it to the more conventional design of a conventional circular mapping catheter. Normally, a conventional circular mapping catheter is a catheter which has one millimeter electrodes. And these one millimeter electrodes have an interelectrode space of around seven millimeter. These sharp or small electrodes will give you sharp bipolar electrograms. Whether you use them in a fixed or in a variable, variable diameter. When you compare these circular mapping catheters to a more con to a more PFAC catheter, as we're going to discuss today, you will appreciate that these electrodes are larger. They have a diameter of length of three millimeter, and they have a large interelectrode space of three millimeter as well. Now, the consequence of this change in electrode size is that the unipolar electrograms recorded by the PIVA catheter are somewhat smaller in amplitude and less steep. The resulting bipolar electrogram will be somewhat more smoothened compared to the small electrodes from the circular mapping catheter. But in clinical use, during a case, you can appreciate that you get the same components on the PVAC electrograms compared to a conventional lesser recording. We always use the PVAC recordings in a set of five pairs. The recording system is a BART EP system and we use a gain of 16 and the filter settings are set from high pass 100 Hertz to low pass 500 Hertz. And you can appreciate the far field potential and the sharp PV potential, just like you would record on a conventional circular uh, mapping catheter. Second thing, and really important for the PVAC catheter, is that you have to be able to identify the position of the catheter itself and of its electrodes at any point in time during the procedure. And today we're going to talk about the mapping position. So you have to know whether you're mapping more osteally or more anterally, and whether the electrodes are facing the anterior wall or the posterior wall. It is relevant to be sure that you are mapping the anterior wall or the posterior wall. And I will explain you why, apologize for this, change in slides. This is a more distal position of a circular mapping catheter. And on the right, you see a more proximal position of the circular mapping catheter. You have to imagine when your catheter, your PVAC, is deep in the pulmonary vein, that you can have at a certain point in time elimination of the local PV potentials. As you can see here, the only thing that remains is far field. But if you pull back the catheter a few millimeters and only a few seconds later, you can appreciate that more anterally, you don't have elimination of the local PV potentials. So this would be an incomplete PV isolation because of not correct interpretation of the position of the PIVA. And you have to continue the ablation before you get the full, nice, anteral isolation. So you have to know the position of the PIVA catheter, but you also have to know which electrodes are facing anterior and posterior. And why is this relevant? Because we have to be able to interpret the far field. This is a scheme from the book I was co-authoring on the PVAC catheter. And what we observe is that the far field is always arising at the shortest angle between the vein and the atrium. So for the right pulmonary vein, you will have far field on the anterior wall. For the inferior pulmonary vein, especially on the posterior wall. And the shortest angles are observed on the anterior part of the LSPV and the LEPV. Basically, you have to know that for the right superior pulmonary vein, you can pick up far fields from the SVC, which is anteriorly, 
The right inferior pulmonary vein typically gives you far field at the posterior wall coming from the left atrium, and that's in almost every case. The left superior pulmonary vein will specifically give you left atrial appendage or more rich far field potentials, whereas the left inferior pulmonary vein typically gives far field potentials from the low lateral atrium or from the left atrial appendage or from the rich. So knowing the position is important during a PVAC case. It is important to either give or to use intracardiac echo or to use enhanced fluoroscopy or to know your fluoroscopic views. It is maybe important to stress that in the right anterior oblique view, you will have a nice anterior posterior orientation of your left inferior pulmonary vein, whereas the LAO view is especially useful to assess the posterior and anterior part of the right inferior pulmonary vein. Of course, you can use 3D rotational angel as we like to use. And here you can appreciate the PVAC catheter in a more proximal ablation position, whereas the PVAC catheter can be positioned in a more distal mapping position as well, beautifully guided by 3D rotational angel. Third point, which is very important, we believe, to validate PV isolation is to take electrogram templates before and during the ablation. So not after the ablation, but before and at different stages during the ablation. And it's important to know where the electrogram templates were taken, so to have a fluoroscopic memory, and to repeat these template recordings during every pacing maneuver. I will give you an example. If you would only concentrate on the right panel, and I show you a PVAC recording from the left superior pulmonary vein, after ablation, during coronary sinus pacing, it would be hard to know whether this potential, whether it's split or not, is a PV potential or only the left atrial appendage. It is useful to have a template recorded in the same position, which then gives you the confidence that this potential was coming from the left atrial appendage and that all sharp potentials were eliminated by the ablation. So without having this template, we would have a hard time in validating PV isolation. So I believe that the comparison of the electrograms is required in any ablation strategy. It warrants some systematic recording so good cooperation with the nurses. And it warrants some memory of the prior recording position in an anatomical point of view. Especially important to repeat the maneuvers during sinus rhythm pacing with or without exit pacing. And to do this before ablation of the vein or of any ipsilateral vein, because ablation of one vein can change the characteristics of the other vein. I believe that this modest initial increase in procedure time will be offset by the gain in time during validation. Here we see an example of how important it might be to take templates not only at the beginning, but also during the procedure. It's a PVAC recording of the left inferior pulmonary vein showing sharp EV potentials and probably more far field potentials on pair four. During the ablation, when you go back to the mapping position, so you have to push the catheter deeper in the vein, you can see that the sharp potentials have an increased cycle length, meaning that they must be PV potentials. And these potentials that did not change are most likely the far field potential. If you continue the ablation in the left inferior pulmonary vein, you will see that in all five PVAC traces, we only have arguments for far field potentials. And that after the cardioversion, it is much easier to appreciate that this vein is isolated and that this potential is a far field potential from the low left atrium. And during pacing, the coronary sign is distal. It is clear that this is a left low atrial far field. So this is an example of 
the importance of the electrogram templates. Finally, I want to discuss with you the use of pacing maneuvers. Now, pacing maneuvers are often being used in the fibrillation, but during BFAC, they are especially useful to perform exit pacing, but Dr. Deneke will discuss on this, but also it is important to use diagnostic pacing maneuvers to confirm entrance block. The first differential pacing mode is just use your coronary sinus catheter. So you don't need at that point in time an extra catheter that has to be brought in transeptally. This is an example of the activation times of the potentials on the PVAC trace during sinus rhythm. In black is the activation time of the far field from that vein, and in red is the activation time of the PV potential. As you can appreciate, for all the veins, the far field and the PV potential are almost overlapping. Only for the right superior pulmonary vein, there is already a differentiation between the far field and the PV potential. Now for the right inferior pulmonary vein, it is easy to differentiate far field from PV potential by pacing the proximal coronary sinus. So that's a maneuver we will consistently use for the right inferior pulmonary vein. For the left veins, we will perform coronary sinus distal pacing. And this maneuver will especially, for the left inferior pulmonary vein, differentiate to a higher extent the far field potential from the local PV potential. So CS pacing is something we perform at baseline as a template during and after the ablation. And I show you one nice example of the right inferior pulmonary vein. Here is a PVAC tracing of the right inferior pulmonary vein during sinus rhythm. As you can appreciate, you have an overlap of potentials, which is far field and PV potential. Simply pacing the CS prox will differentiate the far field from the left atrium to the PV potential. This is our template. We can use this in a memory. And after the ablation, we can repeat the maneuver and we can nicely observe that only the far field is remaining after the ablation. So it's a clear example of the use of coronary sinus pacing. Now, of course, we can add a second transeptal catheter to have more refined far field pacing. Now, the concept is that if you pace at the site where your far field is most likely originating from, that by pacing at that site, you will completely anticipate the far field potential. So for the right superior PV, we will put an extra pacing catheter at the SVC. For the right inferior pulmonary vein, we might pace the posterior wall with the extra catheter. For the left superior pulmonary vein, we like to pace especially the left atrial appendage. For the left inferior pulmonary vein, we like to pace the low lateral atrium. So using an extra catheter can be extremely helpful for further differential pacing of the signals. Here we see an example of the use of differential not pacing, but mapping during atrial fibrillation. Because during atrial fibrillation, we of course cannot pace. And this is an example where we have a PVAC recording in the right superior pulmonary vein with sharp PV potentials and probably underlying far field potentials. Now after the ablation or during the ablation, we put the PVAC catheter again at the same fluoroscopic position, and we observe this slow but sharp rhythm on two remaining PVAC traces. Now, one option could be, of course, to cardiovert 
and to assess whether this potential is a delayed PV potential or whether it is a far field potential. Now, at this point in time, I will show you what you can do without using the pacing maneuver. You can put the catheter or an extra catheter in the SVC, and by doing that, you can record the potentials that coincide with the potentials from the PVAC tracing. So in this case, you don't have to perform differential pacing, but you can do differential mapping. And most likely, these potentials originate from the SVC sleeves. So instead of far field pacing, you can also do some kind of far field mapping. Finally, I'll show one example of a far field pacing maneuver in the validation of PV isolation in a left inferior pulmonary vein. It's C as distal pacing. And at baseline, we have a fragmented, most likely far field potential and a sharp PV potential. After ablation, so proximal ablation, with the prefect catheter, the electrograms are slightly split, but we are not sure whether this is a PV potential or it is a split far field potential. We bring in an extra catheter at the ridge and we record this split potential at the ridge. So most likely this is a double far field and if we base on this extra catheter at the ridge, we completely anticipate the potential. So this is a clear example of a double far field which is unmasked by differential pacing. In conclusion, differential pacing maneuver is extremely useful, especially during the PVAC catheter procedure. Exit pacing, which is addressed in this slide, is another maneuver in which we will pace with an extra catheter or with the PVAC catheter itself within the encircled region. An exit block is shown if after the procedure, pacing within the circle or on the PVAC catheter can show nice capture of the PV sleeves, but there is no conduction to the rest of the atrium, which is still in sinus rhythm. So this pacing maneuver will be discussed in detail by my colleague. I would like to conclude my presentation by stressing the four important points which are needed to validate PV isolation with the PVA catheter. I would like now to switch to the presentation of uh, Dr. Dieneke. He will begin his presentation on documenting PV isolation endpoints using the PIVA catheter, stressing especially the relevance of exit pacing. Thomas, for you. Thank you very much, Matthias, for this very nice introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Deneke, and <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to thank Medtronic for making this event possible because I think it is very, very important. As you all might know, Dr. Deutschkaver is one of the pioneers and expert on the field of phase RF technology and actually is one of the first to use and work with the PVEX. So you should use this opportunity to ask him all the questions you always wanted to be answered. Um, there's quite a bit we can all learn from him, and I already learned quite a bit today. So my presentation will focus on the specifications using the PVAC in validating PV isolation. It is important to recognize that PVAC and phase RF technology is a very young tool, and so we have to be very distinct about our endpoints, know how to evaluate and of course be able to compare to other technologies in order to achieve the optimum outcome. 
On the other hand, we need to know that we have to do as many ablations as needed for optimum outcome, but still not do more because we need to balance on the one hand the efficacy of the procedure and on the other hand complications that might occur if we do uh, many, many more ablations. So my presentation will focus a little on signal interpretation using the PVAC. In the second part, I'll talk about, again, about endpoints for PV isolation procedures. Matthias nicely told you about far field signals and differential pacing, and I will focus a little more on the PV pacing part. And in the end, I'd like to show you a couple of examples and unusual tracings, and this may also allude to the question and answer section in the end. One thing I'd like to stress is that for correct interpretation of the signals, the position of a circular mapping catheter within the pulmonary veins needs to be recognized. This is because the conduction delay, as Dr. Duchkaiva already told you, occurs inside the pulmonary vein and not at the ostium. So in order to differentiate between a local pulmonary vein potential and a far-field atrial signal coming from the left or right atrium, this can only occur if we have some conduction delay, and this is actually a matter of distance from the pulmonary vein. The next slide will just let me introduce to you the, the way our recordings look. You can see right here the fluoroscopic view of a, um, of the, a PA view of the PVAC at the ostium of the left superior pulmonary vein. You can down here see an eight pole a steerable catheter, which is in this in this figure located in the coronary sinus, but actually can be used to be manipulated into any part of the right or left atrium, um, which we may need for differential pacing. If we go to the electrograms, you can see there is the surface EKG in white, and in yellow you can see the bipolar recordings of the PVEC. A1 indicates the distal. PVAC bipole, A5, the proximal PVAC bipole. In green, you see the recordings from the 8 pole mapping catheter. In this case, it is in the coronary sinus, so it reflects left atrial activation. The signals on the PVAC have a multi component, high frequency, and high amplitude configuration, so it timely coincidences with the activation of the left atrium and actually. In this setting, at the ostium of the PV, you cannot say what, what of this signal is actually atrial or what is a pulmonary vein component, and both contribute to this signal. So just by putting the PVAC a little further into the vein, as you can see here, I just put it a centimeter deeper in the left superior pulmonary vein, you can now see that we have created a considerable conduction delay you can see now two components of the electrogram recorded on the PVAC. The first slightly more smooth electrogram actually coincidences with the left atrial activation, so indicating that this is a rather far field signal coming from the left atrium. And you have a second sharp potential, which is delayed and which is the pulmonary vein potential. This signal should be gone after ablation. So many endpoints for PV isolation procedures have been proposed, but the most reliable and most reproducible, as Matthias already told you, is first of all the disappearance of PV potentials named entrance block or and the block during PV pacing, which is called exit block. Sometimes you may be able to see some dissociated pulmonary vein potentials, um, but this may be in about 10% of the veins, at least as far as, uh, as my experience. So you can see in this slide again, I'm with the PVAC deep inside the left superior pulmonary vein, and you can see on the PVAC these small signals that are atrial far-field signals because they coincidence with the left atrial activation, and you can see sharp potentials that are dissociated. That means they have no relation to the preceding or the following atrial um, activation. These signals represent activation of the myocardial sleeves of that pulmonary vein. And when you see something like this, you're sure that you have created entrance and exit block 
in this pulmonary vein. Sometimes you may be able to provoke this by just manipulating or rotating the PVAC inside the pulmonary vein and therefore create some runs of uh, pulmonary vein beats. And if they, are, if they have not conducted to the left atrium, you have proven your endpoint of PV isolation. But most of the time, we actually have to prove our endpoint. That means we have to use stimulation maneuvers to, um, to prove that we have achieved both parts of our endpoint. The first, again, being the entrance block, and the second being exit block, summarized as bidirectional PV block or PV isolation. As Matthias Dutschever already told you, most EP centers actually look for entrance block and only some look for exit block. This is because there are many inconclusive results, so um, you have to be aware of this problem. But when you achieve entrance block in a pulmonary vein, 40% um, of the veins do not have an exit block. And if you want to prevent atrial fibrillation, you of course need to prevent pulmonary vein triggers to conduct to the left atrium, which will, may still be possible if you have only created entrance block. Some studies have also indicated that by just looking for bidirectional block compared to looking at entrance block as an endpoint, you may create superior results in the midterm rhythm outcome. One important player in this game is the time that you wait after PV isolation. So if you have created bidirectional block in the pulmonary veins and you go back to those veins 30 minutes later, you may see that some 40% of the veins show PV reconnection. If you wait 60 minutes, you may have over 50% of the pulmonary veins reconnected. So <clears throat> you need to include a waiting period into your workflow for PV isolation procedures to produce sustained, persistent PV isolation. One thing that Dr. Duchaver told you all about is the far field signals, and this is important because they may be identified more often on the PVAC compared to a regular lasso catheter, which is just due to the specific configuration of the electrode. So far field signals originate from specific areas of the atria depending on which pulmonary vein you're actually targeting. So on the left side, it is most often the left atrial appendage, whereas on the right side, it is either the SVC or the low left atrium as in the right inferior pulmonary veins. And you need pacing maneuvers to discriminate the source of these signals. So the basic con concept of uh, differential pacing is that you stimulate the site of the expected far field origin and you just look what happens on the signals that you're looking at on your uh, pulmonary vein mapping catheter. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. This is the, uh, the signals of a PIVA catheter that is in the right superior pulmonary vein as you can see right here. And on the signals, you can see on the anterior portion of the PVAC, these electrograms. Um, as we know, this is just the site where the SVC spreads in. So we put a second catheter, a mapping catheter, into the SVC. And you can see that the activation of the SVC coincidences with the electrograms that you're looking at on the PVAC. So this may be favoring a far field origin of this coming from the SVC. But in order to, to look into this a little deeper, we, as a next step, do pacing of the SVC close to the site where the PVAC is. And during pacing, you can see that the signals that you just saw on the PVAC are pulled in close to the pacing spike. You have no delayed component electrograms. So this means that this signal is actually a far field HL signal. So this is just as a recapitulation of the basic concepts of differential pacing. If a far field signal originates from a specific region, pacing this site will pull in the signals on your pulmonary vein mapping catheter close to the pacing spike, whereas a time delay between the pacing close to the site of, the, of your PV mapping catheter 
and the electrogram you're looking in you're looking at indicates a conduction delay that suggests a near field or, so pulmonary vein origin 70 milliseconds is a cutoff even though it's not a clear cutoff and you sometimes have to pace more than just one location and you have to pace around the pulmonary vein ostium to uh, be able to differentiate some of these signals. So let me show you an example. Um, this is a electrograms of a left superior pulmonary vein. The PVAC is sitting right at the ostium of the left superior pulmonary vein. And you can see the typical configuration of those electrograms. When you look back here, there are two pulmonary vein extrasystoles coming from that vein, and you can see that the electrogram, the, the components of the electrograms are reversed. You now see that the pulmonary vein component, which is higher in amplitude in this case than the atrial component, is leading, and you see that this is the atrial component because it coincidences with left atrial activation. So after five ablations at the same, pretty much the same location, we still have a signal that shows two components. Again, we're having here an atrial and a delayed uh, sharp potential, which indicates that we have not yet created conduction block into this vein. So we did two more ablations. And after seven ablations, we end up with this electrogram after putting the PVAC into the pulmonary vein. So we put the PVAC deeper into the pulmonary vein, and as a next step, we put our mapping catheter into the left atrial appendage. We did so by just retracting the transeptal sheet into the right atrium and pushing the catheter through the same hole in the interatrial septum and then manipulate it into the left atrial appendage. And now if you look at the electrograms, again, we're having electrograms right at the anterior portion of the PVEC, that is where the left atrial appendage is, and they are coinciding timely with the activation of the left atrial appendage as seen on our mapping catheter. So in order to distinguish if this is all left atrial appendage or where the signal comes from or if there's any contributing um, pulmonary vein potentials, we then do as a next step left atrial appendage pacing. Just have a close look at this, at this electrogram because we'll now have a poll question and just see what you think if we have isolated that vein or not. I think it may be a little a little too short to definitively look at, look at it, but just vote on it and I'll, um, I'll come to the answer in a little while. So you have around 30 seconds for voting and then we'll see the results. Very nice, so most of you actually think that I've isolated that vein and 30% think that I have not. So let me get back to the slide and I'll show you um, what I think about the, the electrograms. And I think it may have been a little too short to look at it definitively, but as you can see in this slide is that um, when it advances, that this vein is actually not isolated. You can see right here that during pacing of the left atrial appendage, most of the signal that we saw right here is pulled in close to the pacing spike, but there is some delayed component electrogram that is a sharp potential. It is tiny, but it is still there. So this is a pulmonary vein potential that should not be there, and this is indicating that we have not created entrance block. And as a second, uh, we have not even yet tested exit blocks, so we have, of course, not isolated the vein so far. So we thought we'd do other ablations, and after a couple of more ablations, we put the PVAC back inside the pulmonary vein. The mapping catheter is still in the, uh, in the left atrial appendage. And as you can see now, these are the electrograms. And one thing I have to tell you is that we have a really high gain on our PVAC electrograms. We've put it to a maximum gain to detect even tiny potentials and not miss any true pulmonary vein potentials, even though by that way we might create some 
potential like looking artifacts that um, that are not real but we need this for evaluation and specifically for evaluation of PV pacing so these are these signals are now more rounded so we did again left atrial appendage pacing and during pacing again all the signals that we saw on the PVEC are now pulled in close to the pacing spike we have a conduction delay of less than 70 milliseconds indicating that this is all far field electrogram and we have no delayed component electrogram anymore so this indicates um, entrance block into the pulmonary vein and we have therefore created a first step in our endpoint evaluation. The second endpoint then is validation of exit block. So we leave the PVAC inside the pulmonary vein and we just pace over each of the PVAC bipoles. So we are pacing around the PVAC. We're pacing the distal bipole and we have no capture. We're pacing PVAC 2, no capture. PVAC 3, no capture. PVEC 4 no capture, PVEC 5 no capture. So what do we do with this? This just leads me over to the second endpoint that is confirmation of PV isolation uh, in, is specifically the conduction block from the pulmonary vein, so exit block using PV pacing with the PVEC. For this, you need to put the PVEC into the pulmonary vein distal to your ablation site and paste over each of the pulmonary uh, of the PVEC bipoles. You should do high output pacing, so you should use 10 volts, 2.0 milliseconds. And with this setup, you may have three opportunities in your results. You either have no capture, you may have near field capture. That means you're capturing the, um, you're capturing the um, myocardial sleeves of the pulmonary veins with or without conduction to the left atrium and you may have far field capture so that means that you're capturing remote areas of the right or left atrium and um, let me give you an example just to show you this is an example of a of the pvac again deep inside deep inside the um the left superior pulmonary vein and we're pacing over the proximal pvac bipole and during pacing, you can see that we have some tiny potentials recorded on the PVEC that indicate local activation of the myocardial sleeves of the pulmonary vein, but we have no conduction to the left atrium anymore. So this indicates local capture and exit block and proves exit block in this vein. We see this in 15 to 20% of the, of the veins, but most of the time, we actually see this. So we see pay, we have pacing within the pulmonary vein, but we have no capture at all. We're not seeing any potentials on the PVEC, so we have not capture of local tissue. So this is often used as a surrogate for exit block, even though it is an inconclusive result and does not confirm exit block. Let me get to one last point and I'm, <clears throat> I will finish in two slides. So this is again pacing of a right superior pulmonary vein and we're pacing with high output, 10 volts, 2.0 milliseconds. The PVEC is inside the right superior pulmonary vein and you can see that we have local capture. We are here having electrograms that indicate that we have captured tissue and we have a one-to-one -one conduction to the ventricle. So in this setting, we put the second catheter into the superior cable vein just to see if we have any uh, any um, electrograms there. And you can see right here that there is a very short time interval between pacing and the activation of the SVC, which most probably indicates um, far field capture. So we reduce output because during high output pacing, you might just override local local capture so we reduce output in this case to 10 volts 1.0 milliseconds and during pacing with a lower output you still see local activation so you have still local capture but you now have conduction block to the left atrium so this proves that you have near field capture with exit block so let me summarize uh, with just giving you a workflow of our um, 
of the way we usually go, uh, we usually work with PV isolations. We intermittently check for PV isolations. So after a couple of ablations, we just look inside the vein for the late potentials. We do pacing over distal coronary sinus for the left pulmonary veins, proximal coronary sinus or SVC for the right pulmonary veins. And if we think we have entrance block, we pace within the pulmonary vein uh, over all PVAC bipoles with high output and see if we have created exit block. If we have done so, we just move on ablating the other veins. And there, this is again where the time comes in. So we have a waiting time in between initial evaluation of PV isolation and then after ablation of all pulmonary veins, we go back to each of the veins and check. With this workflow, we have a um, a time, a waiting time for the left veins of in between 30 to 40 minutes, whereas we have 20 to 25 minutes for the right vein. And in our final evaluation, so to confirm the persistence of PV isolation, <coughs> excuse me, we do differential pacing, so we put a second catheter into the left atrial appendage or some other parts of the left atrium. We're looking for delayed potentials, PV potentials. We are pacing inside the pulmonary vein to and use the second mapping catheter to determine far field sensing and capturing. And when we have far field capture, we adjust output to see if there's anything changing in between far and near field capture. If you don't want to wait um, and reevaluate your vein, maybe a denosin challenge may be a good thing for you, but there are actually no studies out there that indicate that um, using a denosin challenge in your initial evaluation will have the same results as just waiting. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Deneke. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, very didactic and very interesting uh, talk. This concludes um, our formal presentation and our question and answer session uh, will uh, start right now. Uh, so I'm in control of the questions, uh, but um, I think we have about time for four to five questions. We will give a short answer. Uh, Thomas, I have one, one question for you. Yeah. It is, uh, what should I do if I am still not sure about isolation after facing, after maneuvering? Do you think it is okay to perform learning by burning as we have done with irrigated RF previously? Thank you, Matthias. This is an, an interesting question. Um, learning by burning is something that I think we all have done. And um, as far as I think, we all have done, at least to a certain point, done more ablations than we actually needed. And so I think it is, is justified to do that in order to learn and to reduce the, um, the amount of radio frequency ablations that you do in the future. So um, if you are uncertain after all these maneuvers if you have created a, a PV isolation you could of course go ahead and do a couple of more burns and see if anything changes but actually I think with with all the things that we just said um, and if you follow those very very uh, distinctly I think you don't need it anymore in most of the cases okay clear uh, I have another question, which I will be happy to answer. Does checking with PV isolation using a drug challenge like adenosine help outcomes? Is there any published data on how to deploy this technique? Perhaps it's the right time to comment on um, experience we have with the PIVA catheter. It's experience we have together with uh, Dr. De Greef from uh, Middle Aim, uh, in which we analyzed uh, the data on PVAC ablation and on long-term outcome. And in one group of patients, uh, we performed the PVAC-guided PV isolation only, like we discussed today. And in another group of patients, we performed on top of the PV isolation. Uh, we assessed a waiting time of one hour, and we injected adenosine up to a dose which gave us AV block, by, and, and by that we assessed the uh, PV reconnection. 
Now, what we observed in the group in which we tested with adenosine and with a waiting time is that about 25% of the veins did show reconnection using these maneuvers. It was interesting to see that when a vein had initial reconnection with adenosine, and this vein was additionally treated with PVAC, that this vein never reconnected during the waiting time of one hour. But in the veins that were initially proved to adenosine, we had 15% of them reconnecting after one hour. So I think both are important. If we then compare the clinical outcome of the group with PV isolation alone compared to PV isolation with continued ablation until the vein was proved to waiting time and proved to adenosine, we observed a better outcome of about 80% compared to 68% in the group with PVI isolation only. So based on these data, we would advocate the use of adenosine as well as uh, the waiting time in uh, the PVAC catheter procedures. Let's move to the next question, uh, Thomas. Um, yep. I have a question. Uh, do you think that measuring the activation times from the coronary sinus to the PV potentials at baseline might help to better understand the situation after ablation? So it's about the activation time from the coronary sinus to the PV potentials. Is this helpful to get an ID at baseline? Well, this is this is a very interesting question. We we usually don't uh, don't do that. We take uh, we take the electrograms before ablation and compare it to the electrograms afterwards. But one thing that is I think very important to uh, to acknowledge when you use the PVAC is that you uh, you have not a stable position of the PVAC inside the pulmonary vein. So in contrast to using a lasso catheter that you just put inside the vein and compare before ablation, during ablation or after ablation, you, with the PVAC, you put the PVAC into the vein to check if you have a PV potentials and then do your ablations and then you go back to the to the to the position that you had before so this may confuse a little bit um, your results especially when you do a measure uh, the timing of the pulmonary vein potential in the beginning so as a matter of fact we usually don't do it we just stick to the uh, the differential pacing maneuvers after ablation and to the pv pacing uh, protocol that i just showed you okay that's clear um, there was another question. Um, I will be happy to answer that one. What other catheters are needed on hand during a PVAC case? Do we need a lasso? Do we need a quadripolar catheter? Do we need a decapolar catheter for the coronary sinus? Um, I think that a coronary sinus catheter, and I refer to the answer from uh, Thomas, is essential. It is simple. It guides your transeptal puncture. It gives you anatomical landmarks. And coronary sinus is probably the easiest way to do differential pacing and is often enough to do complete differential pacing. Do we need a quadripolar catheter? Uh, we often add a second transeptal catheter to do differential pacing, especially for the right inferior pulmonary vein. It is so useful to pace the posterior wall or it is so useful to paste the appendage for the left superior pulmonary vein. So we add a second uh, quadripolar catheter. This catheter is often introduced passively next to the uh, transeptal sheet, which is uh, easy to introduce after you make the transeptal puncture. Now, the third point, do we need a lasso? You know, lasso is the, 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 the bigger name for all the conventional circular mapping catheters. Uh, I think everybody in the beginning using the PVAC has to convince himself that the veins are really isolated after you have assessed uh, isolation of the PVAC catheter. But after many cases, most of us will find out that the electrograms are reliable. Uh, perhaps the only weak point could be the assessment of the right inferior pulmonary vein because the PVAC catheter 
it's somewhat difficult to place distally in the right inferior pulmonary vein, somewhat more difficult than a classical lasso catheter. On the other hand, if uh, we will have the new technology like the adjustable uh, PIVA catheter, which can have a smaller diameter, and not only bigger, but also a smaller diameter, we will be able to map this pulmonary vein uh, quite easily. So the question is, do we need a decapolar for CS? Yes, quadripolar, sometimes lasso, probably not. Final question, Matthias. Thomas, I think we have uh, two minutes uh, more. Um, okay. Do you, think, do you think that the clinical outcome uh, can be influenced by using the exit block pacing maneuver? <laughs> well, that is a, another good question. And um, I, I feel yes, even though I, don't, I cannot prove it. There is one study out that indicates that your success rates are higher when you look for uh, for bidirectional PV block compared to just looking for entrance block. And to my point, it makes sense for looking that the pulmonary vein triggers should not conduct to the left atrium. Um, but of course, we, we end up with quite a few numbers of inconclusive results. And in this setting, we actually don't know um, how, to, uh, how to actually um, rate these results. So it is. Um, I think it will increase the number, of the your outcome in the midterm. Um, it will probably even add up some more, uh, some more percentage of that. You find out that veins are reconnected or not yet disconnected, so you will do more ablation. Um, but in the end, if this ends up in long-term higher success rates, I think is still unclear. Okay, Thomas, I think we have come to an end. Uh, we spent one hour together, together with the medical uh, audience. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Dineke for uh, his beautiful presentation, for the discussion. I would like to thank the medical audience for their participation and their questions. And of course, I would like to thank Medtronic for their uh, excellent support of this program. Uh, we hope that we have uh, answered your questions and contributed to your knowledge of ver verifying pulmonary vein isolation with the PIVA catheter. Good evening and good morning. Bye-bye.